Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Amanda Benton. I'm an assistant director of alumni relations at Marist and a graduate of the class of 2011. We're excited to present this webinar to you today featuring John Finnegan, senior professional lecturer of finance and economics, and Brian Hahi, associate Dr professor of finance. We're gonna be leading a conversation about budgeting and making smart financial decisions during a pandemic. Before we begin, I'd like to go over some technical notes. Um, in the chat, you should see a phone number. If you encounter any audio issues, you do have the option to dial in by telephone. Um, you will be, need both the telephone number and the code, which are both in the chat box. Due to the number of participants we have signed up for this, I have muted all lines except for the hosts and presenters. Um, please use the chat option if you have any technical questions or if you have any general questions for the Marist staff who are listening today. Please do not send private messages to John or Brian, but if you do have questions, use the Q&A feature on the bottom right side of your screen for questions that you have for the presenters. There are several ways you can view this presentation on your screen. If you hover over the top right corner of the video portion of your screen with your mouse, small icons will appear. Um, we recommend that for a webinar like this that you use the active speaker video view. There will be a brief survey on your screen at the conclusion of the webinar with five questions. If you have a minute, it would be extremely helpful for us to hear your feedback. I'm going to put the information over in the chat box about the, the screen view um, and the Q&A so that you can reference that at your leisure if you need it. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our two presenters today. First, we have John Finnegan. He began working at Marist College in 2003 as an adjunct professor and became a full-time professor in 2008. And he now teaches investment analysis, financial management, financial markets, financial literacy, micro and macroeconomics. At Marist, John is involved in advising for the MBA program, as well as serving as an advisor for the Business Club and Beta Alpha Psi. He also began the Aspire program, which is an international study program designed to help finance and accounting students accelerate their studies and experience international travel. Welcome, John. Thanks for joining us. And our other presenter today is Brian Hahi, who has worked in the security industry for over 20 years. When Marist built its trading floor, he was recruited to bring hands-on real-world experience to the business curriculum. curriculum. He now oversees the Investment Center and the Greystone Equity Fund, which is Marist Student Managed Investment Fund. He has created and teaches finance electives in fi fixed income, structured finance modeling, derivatives and risk management, and a class for students intending to sit for the CFA Level 1 examination. He also provides consulting services to credit rating agencies evaluating exotic structured finance transactions. So John, Brian, thank you so much for spending time with us this afternoon, for sharing your expertise, and I'm going to pass this over to you guys. All right, thanks for having us. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's nice to be here. So um, maybe I'll start, uh, John, by asking a uh, couple of questions. So why do we need a financial plan? And does this uh, you know, current pandemic sort of point out the necessity of having a financial plan? Well, again, first off, having a financial plan, you know, starts really when you enter college for many students and then obviously when you start to earn an income, it becomes more and more important. Uh, looking at the list, some of the students who or the alumni who have uh, signed up to come on to and listen to the program, uh, they've been out of school for quite a while and they're starting to look at maybe other reasons to plan for the future. So again, for a college student, when we teach uh, financial literacy in, on campus, we talk to the students about creating a budget for their spending for the four years they're here. You know, learning how to make sure that the money that they have, either that they earn through working over the summer or from their parents, that they are able to manage it throughout the semester so they don't run out of money at any point. Hopefully, these skills lead to later on in life where you start to work and then you start to look at what are my expenses, what are my uh, income, and how to balance that off. Right, as we go through life, you know, many of us, our plans change. Right? You get married, you might have children. Now all of a sudden your financial plans start to change because of the fact that you have to invest different ways. You might be a parent 
who wants to pay for their child's education. So you may have to set up a, a 529 plan. Now all of a sudden money that you were putting towards your retirement, now you have to allocate money for other sources. If you have more than one child, now you have to do it for two. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, how you look at it, I have five kids. So again, you have to end up planning as you go through and see you know, what are you gonna provide for each of those kids. And then as you get closer to retirement, all right, which many of us are getting closer and closer, you really have to look at what that plan's gonna be. And many of us may have been looking at our 401ks at the beginning of this year. And so I have to look at how nice those numbers were looking you know, for year end of 2019. But when you got your first quarter statement uh, more recently, you're probably looking at those numbers and saying, you know, what has happened here? All right, do I have enough money to retire on? And then again, what plans are gonna change? So again, it's a, it's a skill that's actually re evolving throughout your life. It's a necessary skill, right? Some people do it instinctively, right? Other people need a pencil and paper to write it down or a computer spreadsheet and in order to make sure they can manage all of it. So when we're planning, do we need to, or should we you know, differentiate between short-term goals and long-term goals? Well, most definitely you need to. Uh, you know, many times we talk to individuals and you can set up different types of accounts for different plans that you may have. So say you're a recent graduate from Marist and all of a sudden you start working, well, you have short-term plans. You have, do I need a new wardrobe for school? Do I need a new apartment? Or am I gonna stay at mom's place? Uh, do, do, you, do I need to buy a new car or is mom and dad gonna let me use the old minivan? You know, I always say, you know, you had the old minivan. That's not really the uh, magnet, you know, for, you know, picking up the girls on the side of the road if you're one of those uh, guys out there. So, again, you want to look at the different types of expenses you're going to need. And then the first thing you learn when you on your first day of work is what that retirement plan is going to be. So really, at the same time, you're planning for both. You're planning on what's going to be short term and what's going to be long term. You know, 50 years from when you graduate from college, you're probably going to be retiring, but you need to start as soon as possible. Again, you need to figure out how much I'm going to put into my different retirement accounts, figuring out how do I have enough money to spend for food, groceries, rent, uh, the heating bill, and make sure you can cover all of those before you put all your money into the 401k. So as your income grows, your percentage for your longer term investments will also grow, all right? And then again, and you can attest to this too, those immediate plans upon graduating from college change because now all of a sudden you start to look, new automobiles, moving out of the apartment into a house and so on. So again, your short-term goals are constantly changing. And so if you have different short-term goals and different long-term goals, then does it make sense to if as you're accumulating that money and saving and investing that money, does it make sense to have it in different types of investments? Like, would you, would you, would you tend to keep your short money for short term goals in maybe a savings account and your retirement money more in equities or, you know, should you take risk in, into account when you're, when you're doing your allocations? Well, most definitely you want to make sure what type of risk you can handle. So you want to invest in a type of investments that are not going to have you, uh, you know, constantly upset about what's going on in the market. You have to remember, you know, people who watch the market on a daily basis, they're really looking at, you know, if they're investing only long-term for their retirement and they're worried about the fluctuations on a daily basis, they really, that really shouldn't even affect you at this point in time because it's 50 years down the road. The market's going to go up, it's going to go down throughout those 50 years. The key is as you get closer to taking that money out, and where and what's happening in the market at that point in time. So yes, you need to understand how much risk you can handle, right? Most investors, if they have an invest investment advisor, that investment advisor is gonna give you a risk assessment. And then you're gonna understand what type of risk level you can handle. So obviously you're gonna invest in things that you, know, you understand the risk and they understand or that your investor is going to guide you towards the type of investments that you can handle. On the shorter term, you really have to look at, well, what could happen to my plans in the short term if there is a 
pandemic, right? Look what happened to the market, you know, through the from the middle of February until the middle of April. Right? And you can see it went from almost uh, 30,000 down to 19,000. Well, if you had your money in the market at that point in time and you were planning a vacation or you wanted to buy a car next year or you and your significant other had decided that you were going to start to put a down payment for a house and all your money was locked up in the market, right? You're going to have to wait for the market to rebound now to um, meet those plans. So obviously you want to make sure you allocate your money accordingly and it needs to be more liquid as it closer to being used. So you mentioned a financial planner. Do, do you recommend that people use financial planners? Well, I recommend to my students and I'll tell them that if you don't use a financial planner and you make all the decisions yourself, there's only one person to blame and he's looking back at you through the mirror every morning when you wake up. So if you can do it on your own, meaning that you have the experience, you know, some people who are signed up today, they're actually working in the financial business. So again, they have more knowledge than others. Most of the students who believe they are really good investors today, you know, they're investing in penny stock and they're getting very, you know, uppity when it goes up or down. And they really don't have the knowledge to do it by themselves immediately. So what I would say is if you don't feel comfortable doing it on your own, get a financial advisor. If you feel comfortable doing it on your own and you have that knowledge, all right, you can go right ahead and do it on your own. Do you like the idea of having a financial planner, even if for no other reason than just to have the discipline that you know you have to meet with somebody you know once or twice a year to make sure you're on track for retirement? Yeah, that's a good idea also because of the fact that if they understand what your risk constraints are, they're going to keep you more disciplined than you on your own. You know, you might go out there and see, oh, you know what? Look at this security; it's really taking off. But it might be a security that ex has extreme volatility to it, and it ends up maybe that's not the right security for you. It's out of your uh, risk range, so you might not want to be investing in that. And that advisor is going to tell you. Hopefully, he tells you. So he might have kept you out of Bitcoin. Yeah, he might have. All right. So what what do these planners mean when they talk about paying yourself first? Well, obviously, that comes from many different places, but paying yourself first is obviously, you know, when money comes into your possession, whether it be a, by paycheck or, you know, whatever other means, that you want to make sure that a portion of that goes to you. So, again, you want to make sure you put money aside for whatever reasons that you may need, right, rather than spending everything, you know, right off the bat before you even get a chance to utilize it. Okay, so Amy and uh, Amanda, uh, feel free to, to uh, jump in if there are any questions from uh, from the attendees. Obviously, we'd uh, we'd love to have them. You but have one right now that relates to um, financial planning and hiring a financial planner. Um, do you think that's something that recent grads should look into right away, or is there a particular time or point in a career that it's better to have a financial planner or to start going that route? You want to go ahead? Oh, he's muted. Oh, did we lose him? No, he's muted. John is muted. Well, while, while, while John is getting ready, um, I'll say that that uh, I hit it with my hand as I was going by, I'm getting so excited. <laughs> so um, the question is whether you should uh, get a financial planner straight out of school or you should wait uh, several years. Well, really. It's, it's, uh, it's an open-ended question. It's like insurance too. Do I need to have insurance? Um, so, and we'll, we'll come and talk about insurance later on, but as your, as your wealth starts building up and as your commitments and responsibilities start building up, uh, it's probably prudent to, to start looking for help. So certainly when you first get your job, uh, if you need advice about setting up a 401k or 403 b or an IRA or whatever, then you should certainly avail of that. If, if you can do it on your own, great. If you know exactly you know, that I want to be in stocks rather than bonds or cash, uh, great. 
But as your as your bond starts increasing, as you start thinking about uh, maybe buying a house, as you start settling down with somebody, then certainly at that point, I would recommend that you um, you start looking for a financial planner. And one of the things, maybe John, you can touch on this, uh, is thinking about how the financial planner should be paid. You know, do they get paid a commission? Do we pay them a flat fee? And does that matter? Right. Well, the first thing I would suggest is to make sure that you get a financial planner who's going to serve your needs. Uh, a lot of times, younger investors, people who just got out of school, which is what the, where the question came from, they want to get involved and they talk to their parents because their parents may have financial advisors. I would suggest to students, don't use a financial advisor who is going to be dealing with accounts that are similar to your parents' account because your parents have amassed wealth over the years in which the financial advisor is looking at their, say their account has, you know, a quarter of a million dollars in the account and you're coming in with $10,000. How much assistance do you think you're really going to get from someone who has accounts that are a quarter of a million or a half a million or a million dollars or above and you're coming in with 10,000? So what happens is you should really try to find maybe advisors that are in a similar situation as you. People who are just starting off. Now, again, people are going to say, well, if they're just starting off, what knowledge do they actually have? Well, again, through the preparation for them to get their licenses, they might be more up to date on certain types of securities than an advisor who's been around for a long time because they might be set in their ways. So, again, you want to look at those types of uh, selections as you're going through. Uh, how much or how you should pay? Ideally, you would want to pay, I would say, on a percentage basis annually rather than a commission basis. Because of the fact that the commission basis, right, is usually a pretty high commission for financial advisors. But with that being said, there is a caveat. If you're not planning on utilizing them that much, maybe one trade a year to start to build up your portfolio, then maybe the commission is the way to go. So you're not getting charged on you know, a position consistently where there's really not much activity. Are there certain questions that you think people should ask when interviewing a financial planner? That's a good way to put it. They should be interviewing the financial planner rather than the other way around. Because of the fact that you have to make sure that that financial planner is on the same team as you are. Uh, you don't want them pushing you into investments in which you're not going to be comfortable with. So you need to, to get that out front so they have that understanding that they know exactly what you're looking for so they can serve you best. So the questions are going to be, right, you need to ask them what's their strategy and what strategies that they would use and see if they mesh with what you're thinking. Yeah, and of course, the um, the financial planner, when you meet them, they should uh, make sure, or you should uh, be sure that they fully understand what your goals are, what your willingness and ability to take risk is, what your time horizon is, and all of the myriad factors that really should be taken into account when coming up with a strategy. And of course, as, as John said, um, you should make sure that you understand how they're getting paid. And ideally, your interests will be aligned. So in the normal course of events, if they get paid um, some percentage of your assets, that's much better than uh, just paying them, um, you know, some commission because it's your portfolio, it's in their interest to ensure that your portfolio grows because the bigger your portfolio gets, the more uh, compensation they will get. And also when you first sit in with the uh, financial advisor, the first thing that they should do is they should do a risk assessment quiz for you. So what everything that Brian said about where you, your horizons are going to come into play, they should know that from the results of your risk assessment. So right off the bat, if they don't do that right away, I would be suspect of that individual. I, I interviewed a new uh, broker a few years back. And it's funny because I had always taught in the class that one of the first things the students do in my investment class is take a risk assessment so they know where they actually fall in. And I went in, I was sitting with this new uh, financial advisor from JP Morgan. And the first thing he does is uh, 
gives me a risk assessment quiz. So I got to chuckle out of that, but it was a good thing because of the fact that that's, that's what you should have. They should understand you and then you should understand them. Great. So uh, while we're waiting for other questions, um, this is obviously a frightening time for many people. And unfortunately, a lot of people have been furloughed and a lot of people have lost their jobs. So if, if we're talking to somebody right now or somebody listening right now has just lost their job, so what should they be doing? How should they be trying to get a handle on their finances? Uh, here's where your budgeting is going to come into play and your financial planning because of the fact that you really want to make sure that whatever income is coming in, obviously, if you were furloughed, now you're going to be getting unemployment insurance. In most cases, the unemployment insurance is going to be much less than what your salary was a few weeks ago. So what happens is this is going to infringe on your budget. So that excess money you may have had from your payroll is now gone, and you're going to have a lower amount of money in order to make ends meet. So now, if this is if you're in that situation where you were laid off or furloughed, uh, this is where you want to build those skills up to see this is what's my income, and now what are my expenditures, and which expenditures can be, you know, eliminated at this point in time. So it's good to know that the CARES Act has been passed, a bipartisan act, which um, uh, provides money to, to families. Um, so it's up to uh, $1,200 per adult and up to $500 per kid. Uh, so up to $3,400 for a family of four. So uh, hopefully everybody is aware of that, but if you're not, you can go to the irs.gov website and learn more about the, um, the CARES Act. But if you've been filing your taxes with a uh, direct deposit, check your uh, bank accounts to see if they've hit yet. Because uh, my wife actually is as financial proxy for her father. So she went in the other night and his actually hit. So you want to make sure you, you check because a lot of people have been complaining. I haven't gotten my money. But if you uh, get your returns direct deposit, it might be there already. And what about uh, taking a loan? if, if I you know, need cash in the short term. Should I think about taking a loan for my 401k or my IRA? If it can be avoided, I would try to avoid it at all cost. Uh, the first thing I would probably suggest is first looking at your expenditures on a weekly, monthly basis and see these checks coming in, whether it be from the CARES Act or from uh, unemployment insurance, all right, if they're able to cover the bills, that would be good. If you have savings and you're able to utilize your savings, all right, that also would be good. As a last resort, I would say, look at those retirement accounts. Right, so if yeah. you can avoid it as best as possible. Yeah, generally, we don't like touching our retirement accounts. Now, there is one provision under the CARES Act, which is that you can withdraw up to $100,000 uh, without a penalty, without the typical 10% penalty, even if you're not 59 and a half. Uh, but you, have, you uh, have to pay taxes, so you have up to three years to pay those taxes, and uh, you can then repay the money over three years um, outside of the normal contribution limits. So, um, so just be aware that, yes, if you have a, a 401k, you can withdraw from it, but it's really a last resort and uh, you should plan on trying to replenish it as soon as you can. Because remember, when you the, the market is down somewhat now. So when you take money out today, you're taking it out at, at uh, you know, below where the market was. And then when you go to replenish, you'll be putting back in and hopefully the, the market will have risen. So you'll, you'll miss out on that, um, that market appreciation. Actually, oh, sorry. Actually, one of the things that if you do have money, if you're someone who's actually still working now uh, and your IRA contributions, I know the deadline for 2019 was April 15th. Uh, personally, I ended up when the market went way down, uh, I put my IRA contribution in for 2019 and for 2020 or a few weeks ago. Uh, because of the fact that the market was so down, I was getting everything on sale, right? And as uh, Brian said, hopefully the market goes back up. It's been going up, so that's a good thing. So uh, if you have the money and you are working, make contributions to uh, 
uh, your IRA, or if you increase your contribution to your 401k because of the fact that since prices are low, all right, they're going to hopefully go back to where they were, and then you're going to make all that money back plus some on your new investments. Yeah, and just to, just to stress that we're obviously not making any, um, um, or we're not providing any financial advice in this webinar, and we're certainly not uh, dictating how you should or should not be investing. But it is worth noting that uh, in the midst of the panic, um, which was exacerbated by fluctuations in the oil market, that the S&P was down 30% uh, from January 1st through the middle of March, but it's actually recovered about 20% of that. So year to date, the market's only down about 9%. Um, now, having said that, none of us know um, what the impact on the economy is going to be going forward. We were at historic low um, levels of unemployment. The unemployment rate in February was actually only three and a half percent. We know there's tens of millions of people probably going to be filing for unemployment and that those rates will be increasing. So what happens over the next six months is anybody's guess. But the one thing that we can bank on is that in the long run, the US stock market performs very, very well and is the ideal vehicle for uh, your retirement planning. And many of you just pointing out the fact that you mentioned the S&P 500, many people's investments in their retirement accounts are in funds that follow the S&P 500. So that's a great benchmark to utilize. Amanda, do you have another question? Yeah, a couple of people jumped in with questions in uh, relation specifically to the pandemic and stocks and purchasing things. Um, you touched on this one a bit. Um, due to the pandemic and the, the lower cost, is this a good time to start investing in stocks and building on your portfolio? And then a question that was similar to that, um, is it better to be investing in the stock market at this point or using a savings account instead? The savings account, uh, uh, the Fed chairman came out today and said, uh, rates are gonna remain at zero. So your bank account is probably gonna get a whopping quarter of a percent interest on it. So uh, the market is still down 10% from uh, the beginning of the year. So I think a 10% return is a lot better than a quarter of a percent return. So again, if you need the cash because of the circumstance, you, don't, you only invest where you can invest. Don't invest the rent money or anything like that. Yeah, and just to, to elaborate on that, as, as John mentioned earlier, when we talked about liquidity, uh, imagine that you were saving to buy a house and um, you had all your money in the stock market. And um, in the month of March, you saw the stock market drop about 30 percent. Well, I think you would not be a happy camper. Um, so if you've got if you have short and medium term uh, goals, you should certainly make sure that that cash is in a, um, you know, in a liquid account. An idea, a savings account is, is good for that or money market account, something similar. But certainly anything that's medium to long-term, uh, certainly history shows us that uh, you wanna be in the stock market because think about the stock market as really a proxy for the long-term economic growth of the country. Uh, so all the productive uh, businesses, the Facebooks, the Apples, the Netflix, you know, the Dow chemicals, whatever company you can think about, um, their, their profitability is really manifested in the stock market. And so if you want to share in the prosperity of the American economy, you want to be in the stock market. Now, people will sometimes say, and many financial advisors will recommend that with your retirement cash, you, you do maybe a 60-40 mix of 60% in the stock market and 40% in the bond market or vice versa, 40-60 mix. And some of them will suggest what's called a lifestyle fund or life cycle fund where maybe, you know, 100% minus your age uh, gets invested in, in the stock market, the remainder in bonds. And that over time, um, your money migrates from the stocks. As you get older, you put more and more into bonds. And these life cycle funds will do that automatically for you. Now, I, I personally have a caveat about that because I think many people don't understand that the bond market has performed really well over the last 40 years because interest rates have been coming down. But I, uh, for those of you who uh, subscribe or are members of the American Association of Individual Investors, they publish a journal and I have an article coming out on Friday where I talk about 
the fact that the bond market is probably riskier than it has ever been before. That's a combination of low interest rates and um, low liquidity and a variety of other factors. So I, I, I personally would recommend that for your long-term goals, you think uh, very seriously about putting as much in the stock market as you can, maybe put in less maybe than you might have been thinking in the bond market. But having said that, if you are going to be in the stock market, you want to be somewhat conservative. Uh, so, you know, you should focus um, on the portion of your assets that you that you might have had in the bond market. Maybe think about putting them in large cap stocks. Maybe think about having that money in stocks that pay dividends. So, you know, the, the Coca-Cola's of the world and the, the Johnson & Johnson's of the world and the, the big traditional stable companies, those are where I could put the core of my equity market uh, application. John, do you have any comments on that? I was going to ask you a question. So you mentioned the lifeline uh, or the lifestyle accounts. Would you suggest to individuals to avoid those until they get to a much older age and just utilize the uh, maybe indexes and, you, and for large cap stocks in their 401ks or 403s? And again, you're, you're, this is where the benefit of having financial advisors and financial planners uh, come in, because I, I'm not saying that my advice is correct. And uh, certainly your financial advisor may have slightly different uh, perspective. So the life cycle funds are, are typically predicated on the idea that 100 minus your age or 120 minus your age is in stocks and that the remainder is in bonds. So that would mean 100 minus your age. If you're, 20, if you're age you know, 25 right now, that it would put 75% in stocks and 25% in bonds, and that over time it would automatically uh, allocate you more and more into bonds. But personally, even 25, if somebody is that young, you know, I would be a little uh, concerned about, you know, being over, even maybe a 25% allocation to bonds might be too much for a young person. I personally, um, if I was that age, would be, you know, probably close to 100% in stocks, recognizing that I've got 40 years to retirement and that while we, while we we're experiencing right now the vicissitudes of the stock market and the fact that it can it is volatile it can come down but if you believe in the american economy if you believe in the american dream as hopefully all of us do then the the future uh, prosperity of the country will manifest itself in the stock market um, and so if you're a young person i would recommend that now having said that if you're close to retirement, you certainly need to think very prudently about what your allocation is going to be. As I say, imagine you were uh, coming close to retirement. You were planning to retire on April 1st, and you open up, uh, you know, you see what happened in the stock market in March where you, where the, you lose 30% of your assets. You would not want that to be happening um, the day or, you know, the weeks or months before retirement. So certainly it's prudent to not to be 100% invested in the stock market as you get close to retirement. You may have some assets in the, you know, some proportion in the bond market, but there are alternatives too, where you could, some advisors would recommend, well, stay, stay largely in the stock market, but make sure that you have, you know, two or three years of living expenses uh, in a bank account somewhere. So th there's a variety of strategies that you can choose. It really fundamentally, ultimately depends on your willingness and ability to take risk. And also, just to jump in on that one is, as you contribute to your 401k, as everyone, you're contributing every two weeks. So as the market goes down, you're buying when the prices are lower. So you are purchasing more shares every two weeks. And as the, as your, as the market grows, right, again, you bought lower and it's going up. So sometimes you're buying when the market's high, sometimes you're buying low. But again, keep your contributions in during those low times because you're able to get things while they're on sale. Also, if some of you have 529 accounts, the 529 accounts work very similarly to the life cycles. As your child gets closer to uh, going to school, they switch your investments to more conservative investments as your child progresses you know, through their teen years up until they're 18 and going away to school. Amanda, any more questions for us? Uh, two on the pandemic and a couple that are on other topics. We can come back to them if you want. But the other two on the pandemic, um, one of them is 
If you can still afford to pay your mortgage, but your mortgage company is allowing you to delay for six payments, is there any benefit to saving that money for future emergencies, or would you pay the payments as usual? Well, just to 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 jump in, it um, it depends on how um, uh, disciplined you are going to be. So if if you've been budgeting to make your monthly payments. And now your, your mortgage company says that we're going to give you forbearance of, you know, six or eight weeks or whatever it is. Uh, and you can take that cash. Well, if you just go out and spend that cash on, you know, paying for the next vacation or whatever, then it's probably not a good idea. Um, and remember, and this is important for people to understand, not just about their mortgages too, but also their car loans and that. When, when a lending institution forbears, in other words, where they, they, they allow you to delay making the payments, um, they're just doing that to, you know, at government prompting, obviously, but they're just doing that to uh, increase your financial flexibility. They're not waiving those payments. And many people may think, oh, I'm, I'm, they're just knocking two payments away. I don't need to make those two payments. You do still need to make, to make those payments. It's just that they've been delayed. And, you know, in fact, interest may accrue on those uh, delayed payments. So, uh, you know, if, if you're confident in your job, if you don't need the money, I would say continue making the payments as scheduled. But if you are in some financial distress, then, you know, think about it and if appropriate, take advantage of the offer. I would really make sure you check with your bank to make sure that uh, if the interest is still accumulating because your balance is gonna stay higher for two more months, so you're going to be paying extra interest when your payments start up again. So that would be my major concern. But everything else that Brian said, I agree with. If you can make your payments, you might as well. If you need that money from the uh, mortgage payment to cover other things in your life, as long as they're cost strictly to food and, and things like that, that's where you should put your money. And lastly, do you know how the money from the CARES Act is going to affect tax filing next year? I believe it's all taxable. But I'm not, I, I can't say that. I'm not a CPA, which is another profession that you might, if you're doing your taxes, you're not sure, you know, get a CPA to do your taxes too. Well, you know, as, as uh, as it says in the good book, the Lord giveth and the Lord take it away. So Uncle Sam giveth and Uncle Sam taketh away. So I know we, um, we, we did have a question, I believe, on, uh, from somebody who was thinking about buying a house. Uh, so John, what do, you, what do you think? Should they go ahead in this, in this environment and buy their house? Well, I, I can tell you a quick story. Last night I was on the phone with my roommate from college, right, all those years ago, and he's a realtor. And he's saying that business is going on as usual. It's just virtually, which ends up being a, a bit of an issue for the home buyer. And the reason being, if you've never bought a house before, uh, you have a final walkthrough as you go through. So you can see everything is in proper order. Now, if they do things virtually and you don't get to step foot in the house because the people selling might not want to interact with you, or you might not want to go into a house where, you know, you could potentially get sick. You have to do these things virtually and you need, you, you really want to keep an eye on that. Someone moved in down the street from me a month ago. So right at the time of the pandemic beginning and they're having septic issues. And one of the things that should happen when you're closing on your house is you have to make sure the people who are leaving clean out the septic tank before you move in. So some things like that might fall through the cracks, but otherwise I would say if you're buying a house now, you're gonna get very good interest rates on your mortgage. So if that's the case, plow ahead. Yeah, and just to follow up, um, home sales um, are down this month about 20% uh, year over year. So uh, I would say that it's a great time to be a buyer. Uh, it's a buyer's market. Uh, as John said, interest rates are very low. The 30 year mortgage rate today is 3.56%. Believe it or not, that's not actually the lowest on record. Uh, it was actually lower in September, 2016. It was about 3.3%. But again, I've got a caveat for you. Um, if you're at all concerned about your job, um, recognizing that 
the full impact of this pandemic is still evolving. We don't know what the economy is going to be like in six months. I'm pretty confident and optimistic. I think we'll look back at this and say it wasn't as bad as we had feared or had been led to believe. But that's just my opinion. I'm not always right, although I tell my students I am always right. Um, so we, we don't know what's going to happen. But if you're if you're really confident in your job uh, and your financial position, then by all means. But just recognize that you know you may get um, you may get a good deal by waiting till summertime because you know some other people will be in distress and not in a position. But uh, certainly interest rates are exceedingly low, and uh, it's a great time to be a buyer if you can afford it and if you're secure. We have a couple questions that are kind of outside of the uh, the pandemic realm. Um, Mary. <laughs> How, how would you um how should you balance paying down debt versus saving and investing for the future? Well, I'll, I'll jump in uh, first. Um, at the at the end of the day, um, uh, it's it's one opportunity cost and two security. Um, so you always want to be sure that that you have sufficient lines of credit, um, that your credit is, is, um, is secure, so that in the event of an unfortunate event where you lose your job, uh, that you're able to continue and you're able to, you know, uh, finance, you know, four or six months of, of living expenses. But one, once, you're, once you've got that comfortable safety net, then the trade-off really between investing and paying down debt should fundamentally be um, from my perspective, um, what, are, what are the costs? So what, what interest rate am I paying on my loans? You know, if, if, they're, if they're credit card debt and it's, you know, 15 or 20 percent, then clearly you want to pay that down as soon as you can. Uh, on the other hand, if it's a long term loan where you're only paying, you know, three, four, five percent interest and you can be fairly confident um, if you're fairly um, sanguine about the prospects of the equity market for example and you believe that in the long run you know you can earn 10 for eight to ten percent in the stock market then it makes sense to take advantage of that but really it's up to you um uh to first of all weigh those those um uh you know potential pros and cons think about how you are in your long-term goals but fundamentally make sure you have that safety net and make sure that if the stock market does not uh, pay out as you had anticipated, that it's not going to pose major trouble for you. I, I'd add that uh, you really want to look at what you're earning in your savings accounts and what the loans are. I'm sure many of you might have student loans, and student loans, even over the last few years when interest rates were fairly low, were still up in the high five, six percent area. So if you see your savings accounts where you've built your safety net, and you have money in in those savings accounts in which you're only earning a quarter of a percent a half percent you know it might make sense for you to look at those student loans find out which ones have the highest rate of interest on them and pay them off a little quicker each month you know if you could pay if you have enough money and pay off a whole loan at a time you know that's great for you but if if you're only earning a, a quarter of a percent and you're paying out six and a half percent Seems like we're losing here, so you might want to put some of that money you're saving and pay off your loan a little quicker. Remember, everything that you pay in the student loan, it goes right to principal. So the principal gets reduced right away. So that's dollar for dollar, and you're taking that off. And then, therefore, it's going to earn when they charge the interest, you're going to be paying less interest to the bank. So you're going to be able to keep more of that money, even though you will pay the loan off, you'll pay it off faster. And you won't pay the bank as much money. So and if you have extra, I'd pay back down some loans. Yeah. And just to to um to add a further point to that, to remember that in the future you're probably if you're young, you know, if you're you know 20 something and you're you're out of school and you're in you're you have these student loans, remember that in the future you're going to want to be thinking, you're likely to be want to be thinking about taking a mortgage out to um, buy an apartment or a house or something like that. So your credit score will look good if you have um, systematically been paying down debt. Um, so you know the bank, if they, if if uh, th think about the two scenarios, if the bank looks at you and you've been putting money into an investment account, but you still have a big loan out there, 
that's one thing. If they look at you and you've been paying down your loan over time, that's probably going to look better uh, to the bank from a credit perspective. So it will probably improve your credit score. It would certainly likely improve your chance of getting a favorable mortgage uh, down the road. So bear that in mind too. And also even to, in today's world with the low interest rates on loans, you can get a personal line of credit which might have a lower interest rate on it or even a shorter term than your school loans. But you can refinance those loans on your own you know, maybe at half the interest rate, maybe at half the term, and you'd be able to pay them off much more quickly. Again, this all depends upon the fact that your income is going to be secure as you're going forward. Because if your income isn't going to be secure, doing all this, you're going to run into the same problems. You're not going to have money to pay your loans off. So it all falls on the individual. So while we're giving blanket um, examples and blanket advice, the individual has to answer these questions on their own. And maybe one last point on this topic is, um, uh, you know, they, they say that uh, every cloud has a silver lining. So, you know, maybe think about this pandemic as having the silver lining. The silver lining is that as we're restricted to our homes, our expenses have probably gone down. You know, we're probably not likely to be going on that expensive vacation, that cruise, you know, that trip to the south of France, that trip to Vegas, whatever it is. So, you know, think about taking that cash and if we're comfortable in our jobs, if we, if, um, you know, if we're not worried about losing our jobs, then take that cash that you would have spent on vacation and put that towards uh, paying down your loans. Great. Uh, someone asked, um, they said, I find it hard to assess whether my savings are quote unquote responsible for my age. Do you have any advice on benchmarks that can help us know whether our savings are on the right track? Well, there's um, um, many great websites that you can go to um, to, you know, that suggest how much you should have uh, in your retirement account or your savings account uh, for your age. In short, I'll say we generally never have enough. Um, now, uh, you know, some people would say that um, uh, when you reach retirement age, you need to think about a couple of things. Um, so you need to think about the income that you currently have. Um, so let's pick a simple number, let's say $100,000 a year, just to, to make it a round number. Um, well, you're not really living on, on $100,000 because you are presumably taking some of that $100,000 and putting it into, um, into savings. So maybe you're putting $10,000 a year into your, save, into your 401k. So that really means that you're, you're working off a, a gross income of maybe $90,000, for example. Uh, so then you think about it in retirement. Well, I'm going to be on Social Security. I'm going to be receiving Social Security, maybe. Uh, but let's imagine that that's going to be, you know, 20, let's say $30,000 a year, round numbers, right? Um, so, okay, we've $90,000, we've got $30,000 coming in. So maybe I need to come up with $60,000, you know, pre-tax. Um, so then you say, well, uh, if I have that money invested for the long run, you know, what, what would I need to have in, in the bank and, uh, or in investments uh, to come up with 60 grand a year? And people, people would say, well, maybe you can assume that um, you can earn after inflation, maybe three, three percent, let's say. So if I've got a million dollars in the bank, I can, I can earn um, $30,000 a year on that. Uh, you know, after inflation. So that would mean, well, if I need, if I need to have $60,000 a year to live on outside of uh, Social Security, I need to have $2 million in, the, in my retirement account when I retire. If I'm going to be living on less, I can afford to have, have less. So, you know, that's sort of the calculus that a lot of financial planners would, would use. Others would say, you know, you need to, you need to make sure that you have maybe 10 times your 10 or 11 times your final retirement salary uh, in, in, reti in your retirement accounts. Um, but, you know, the, the answer really depends on where you're going to be living, what your lifestyle is going to be like. Most people generally for the first you know, five or 10 years after retirement, they actually spend more than they had anticipated spending. And then after that, they're, they're less active, but their uh, health costs go up. But, you know, ballpark, think about um, that factor of 3%, so scale up by, by 30, by a factor of 30, or think about last, last year's uh, salary, maybe a factor of 10 or 11 times that. But there's plenty of other, plenty of websites that you can go to, um, to, to give you advice. But maybe, John, you've got some comments? 
Uh, you were pretty long. I think I forgot everything I was going to say. No, I, what I would suggest is as you go through, uh, you're also going to be using part of that principle that you've built up as you go. But every time you take money out of, and, and this is one of the reasons why we said earlier, don't don't go into your 401k now because what happens is you're going to have less principle as going forward. But you know if you're earning three percent a year on that two million or one million you have. If you're going to be utilizing that principle, that balance is going to be coming down each year. So you're going to be earning 3% off a, or off of a lesser amount every year as you take the money out. So I think the big concern is you really want to look at when you're getting close to retirement, what are the annual savings going to, or what's your annual earnings and spending currently? And then plan on that as being your spending going forward. But I think the pandemic has gotten us into the role and what life's going to be like when you retire. You know, you really don't go out as much. You stay around the house. You might not be spending as much money as you did previously. So you, you start to figure out maybe we don't go out to dinner as often as we did. Uh, some of the expenses that we used to have, you start to realize now, do we really even need those? All right, and then you can end up fixing whatever that budget or plan is going to be when you get close to retirement. So um, I want to end back on the stock market kind of questions. I have two, um, both about beginning investing outside of a 401k. So the first is just, do you have any suggestions for best practices to begin investing in the stock market outside of a retirement 401k, 403b? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll kick off first. Um, you, you need to have a, a brokerage account, so an, an account at a, a stock broker, you know, it could be TD Ameritrade or Interactive Brokers. There is a company called Robinhood and, you know, some other uh, companies like that. Um, so they're completely no frills. Um, uh, I haven't used them myself, so I can't really comment on them. But uh, you find a brokerage account wherever you want to go. But I would suggest for, for, the, for somebody starting off, um, you want to go into an index ETF. So you, you um, if you want to play, you can go and pick individual stocks. But if you're more serious about getting started with a long-term investment horizon and investment plan, I would think about investing in ETFs, exchange-traded funds, and specifically in an index fund. So an S&P 500 index or a NASDAQ technology index fund, uh, something like that to get started. Then as you get more comfortable, as you get more experienced, you can think about, uh, you know, trying to uh, be more creative in, you know, finding particular sectors or particular stocks that you want to invest in. Again, this question goes back to what we spoke about previously. Are you going to have Pfizer or are you going to do it on your own? So uh, that's really the first question that needs to be asked, how you're going to do that. The suggestions that Brian gave are great. Or, you know, you start off with an index, you utilize that, it's gonna give you an overall market as you go through. Picking securities is a little difficult. You know, I would suggest if you get into a uh, ETF or some type of an index fund as you're going forward, the easiest way to learn on what to pick is just simply read. All right, if you get the Wall Street Journal on a daily basis, I always tell the students, you don't need to read the whole newspaper. Uh, if you're in, involved in investments, go to the investment section, read a couple of stories that are of interest to you. Or if you're looking at other markets, you know, you can look at the different, the markets page, you can look at the economics page, and you can just read articles. Again, you don't need to read them all. If it interests you, continue. If not, jump to the next story. It's a big paper. So what happens is you can learn on your own as you go forward, have discussions with people, First off, whom you trust and who's not going to give you tips, because normally if someone gives you a tip, they benefited and it's already happened. So the likelihood of it happening again is less likely. So you really want to see, understand how the market works, read, all right, and start off slow, take baby steps. And then, you know, once you feel more and more comfortable doing it on your own, then you're going to be able to make the selections that are going to be best for you. It's like anything else. If you practice, you're going to get better at it. 
And then just one final quick question to end on. Um, do you think there's a minimum amount that one should make before it's acceptable to get a financial advisor? Not really make, how much they're gonna actually invest. Uh, you know, you, you could have someone who has a very rich grandmother who passes away and leaves them a lot of money. They might not be making that much money, but now they have a large sum of money and what are they gonna do with it? You don't want a young person to blow through money like that. Uh, I know, uh, you know, when people pass away, like grandparents pass away, sometimes they'll leave money to their, only to their children, and then others will leave it to the grandchildren. Uh, for those who are older, I, I would suggest the, the first part of that, leave the money to someone who's your child, who's a little older rather than a young person, because the younger person doesn't have the discipline to invest that money, they're going to want to spend it. You know, woohoo, good times down in the Jersey Shore. You don't want them wasting all that money. So uh, you really want to look at the situation, not so much at how much you're making, but if you're looking at how much you're making before you uh, invest because you don't have a, a rich grandma, uh, you really want to utilize the money that you can afford to lose. And, you know, if we're talking about a financial plan and, and, and saving for, you know, beginning a journey towards, you know, 40 year journey towards retirement, um, you know, in many cases, try and find somebody who's maybe of a similar age to you. Um, you know, there are a lot of very successful financial planners out there, but, you know, they may be retiring 5, 10, 15 years down the road. So if you, and some of them, you know, may have very wealthy clients and don't need somebody who's small. Uh, but an ambitious, you know, young financial planner um, will recognize your potential just as you recognize their potential. And they know that over time, uh, you know, your salary will grow, your net worth will grow, and uh, it'll, be, it'll be in both your interests. So uh, it's, never too, it's never too early to start, um, but you just want to make sure that uh, your financial planner, your prospective financial planner is not charging you too much as a percentage of you know, what you're uh, beginning to invest with. You grow together. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Um, in consideration of everyone's time, I'm going to wrap it up. It's just hitting four o'clock now. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us um, and for keeping the Marist Alumni Association in your life during these uh, difficult times. Um, and thank you, of course, to Brian and Joan for spending time with us and sharing your expertise. Um, a couple people asked if they could get a copy of the recording. Yes, we have been recording it. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat. We'll also send an email out tomorrow or possibly the next day um, with that link in it. Um, you will see past recordings on there as well. Um, this site does take about 24 hours to spit out the recording because they are about an hour long. Um, so we'll try and get that up to you by, by Friday. Um, but again, we'll send an email out with the link as well. So thanks again, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. And thank you again to John and Brian. Thanks.